Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the complimentary ICMI webinar, Why Self-Service is the Secret Sauce for Customer Satisfaction, sponsored by support.com. I'm Erica Maroy, Community Specialist here at ICMI, and I'll be your moderator today. And before we begin, I just want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. So first thing, please make sure you disable your pop-up blocker if it's currently turned on. You'll notice there are several icons at the bottom of your console window, and the first one that you see allows you to view the presentation slides, so you want to make sure to maximize this one. Next, you'll see a Q&A icon, and we'll be saving some time at the end of today's webinar to answer your questions, so you can submit them at any time during the presentation by typing your question into that window and then clicking Submit. Now, if at any time you experience any technical difficulties during our presentation, you can also click that question mark icon on the console to access the event help guide. Clicking on the other icons that you see will give you access to speaker bios, more information about our sponsor, support.com, as well as some information about upcoming ICMI events, resources, and research. And speaking of upcoming events, I do want to highlight that our Global Contact Center Awards program is now open for submissions. And we did add several new categories this year and simplify the entry process a bit. So make sure you head over to icmi.com slash awards to check that out. And um, if you enter by the end of this year, you can actually take advantage of 25% off savings. Uh, now, before we get going, I do want to let you know that we will make this presentation available for on-demand viewing following our live event today. Uh, so you'll receive an email in the next couple of days with instructions for viewing the recorded presentation. You can actually also download a PDF version of today's slides directly to this console. And as you're watching, we encourage you to be social. You can actually access your Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn accounts directly to the event console. So keep the conversations going and share what you learn. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. I'm joined by Roy Atkinson, who's Senior Writer and Analyst for HDI. And Susan Cohen will also be speaking today. Susan is VP of Partnerships and Alliances for Support.com. As I mentioned, you can learn more about Roy and Susan by clicking on the speakers icon that you see on your console. And as you can see, we've shared some hashtags and handles here on your screen. So one final reminder, please be social and share what you learned today and just keep the conversations going. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So Roy, take it away. Thank you so much, Erica. And I hope everybody is doing well today. I'm just going to push up the first slide. So. Let's start off by looking at the customer side of the equation here, which is always a good place to start from my perspective. And let's see what customers say they expect from the service portion of your business. And 90% of customers identify speed as a priority. They want their, their problem fixed or their an question answered, and they want it now. In addition to that, 70% of customers expect self-service. So they expect to have that option to get self-service self from your website or from your telephone via IVR, some aspect of self-service is what they expect. And that comes, that's a research that's published in Fast Company. If you download the PDF, you can go through that link. It was SSI Research and Stephen Van Bellingham. So let's look at this in a little bit of uh, perspective. One of the things that's really important to know about self-service is that you're not going to be able to answer every question or solve every problem. You've probably already figured that out, but let's talk about it a little bit. 36% of customers say that they pursue a solution on the company's website or via email, so via electronic methods, for simple inquiries, while only 10% pursue the solution using those methods for a complex inquiry. As the complexity increases, the higher the demand to either talk to a live person on the phone to help resolve their problem, so assisted support, uh, or actually get to somebody face-to-face. -face. And that comes from the American Express Global Customer Service Barometer. If you're not familiar with that research, I highly suggest it. It's done every two years. It's a huge study, and it really gives you a tremendous amount of information. So one of the important things to note about this is that complexity is what drives channel choice. They're going to go to self-service or not, depending on the complexity of their issue or how they perceive the complexity to be. Um, and what that means in terms of your business, we'll talk a little bit more about in a second, but just bear in mind 
that the simpler inquiries are going to go to self-service, the more complex ones are going to come through to your contact center, which means that your first contact resolution may go down because you're handling more complex questions consistently and the simple ones have gone away. So just bear that in mind. So to the customer, what they want to be able to do is they want to find answers and solutions fast and they want to enjoy the product or service more. So picture yourself in the middle of, let's say, getting a brand new vacuum cleaner home. And you're putting the parts and pieces together and you can't quite figure out to get the hoses to, to fit together. You want to be able to get to use that product right away. So you want the answer fast, as we said right at the top. And what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to look at the website and see if there's instructions available. Maybe there's a video that shows you how to put the hoses together. And maybe there are some written instructions that will help you put the pieces together. To the business, the value of the self-service is that you may have a call or contact decrease because people are taking those simpler inquiries online. You'll be able to be more efficient in your operations because you won't be doing the repetitive stuff over and over and over again. You're going to be putting your people where they're valuable, which is in resolving the more complex issues that customers have. So that's a better use of staff time. Now let's remember that today customers are mobile and time challenged, big time. Uh, a lot of times people don't have the option of calling you and talking on the phone or waiting in a queue simply because they run into a snag using your product or service when they're at the airport ready to board their plane or when they're uh, on a, you know, a sales mission and they're, they're stopping for lunch at the local Starbucks or whatever, sitting at a table in Starbucks, you're probably not going to be want to talk to uh, the contact center on the phone and annoying everybody around you. So keep, bear that in mind, always looking at the customer perspective. They're on the go a lot, and they're very, very busy people, as are we all. So let's talk about what really needs to happen inside your self-service. What, what do you need to include? And the most important thing from my perspective and from the experience that we've had at HDI and, and with the businesses that we talk to is that it's important to have real questions from real customers. So it's great to, to kind of seed your FAQ with some things that you anticipate customers will want to know, but as soon as you start getting questions through your contact center, record them and get them into your customer-facing knowledge. Make sure that those questions can be answered and make sure it's in the language that they speak. So while you refer to something one way, uh, maybe maybe you refer to that vacuum hose as the uh, extender hose, but the customer may not know that. They just are, call it the vacuum hose. So if they start looking at your online knowledge for vacuum hose and they don't find it because it's called an extender hose in your knowledge base, they're going to get increasingly impatient and you're going to wind up with an impatient customer on the phone. So it's it's so important to use their language. People want to access their order or contact history, and so that should be readily available to them. If they have to log in to get their customer history, they're happy to do that. We all do it at places like Amazon, for example. Easy access to manuals, how-to guides, you know, videos, and patches if you're a software company and you're, re you're releasing things to the customers. They want to be able to get the latest patches. That should all be very accessible to them for download. And then you, you want to have contact info for customer service on every page. Why? Because if people are searching for things, they want to be able to move, if they have to, from that unassisted self-service into assisted service easily and readily. So the contact info should be very available. It's one of the frustrations that I think a lot of people suffer these days is trying to find phone numbers. Sometimes you really have to hunt through some uh, company's websites to get to the contact information when you need to change channels from unassisted service to assisted service. Or people will go to social and hope that you have uh, an account somewhere. and uh, Maybe they'll do a Google search uh, to see if you have a, a customer support Twitter handle. If you have that handle readily available on the page or have a button to click, click to go over to live chat or a button to click to go to Twitter, so much the better. Make it easy. So this is some research that we 
done at HDI, and our our audience is is a blend. We are uh, people do internal support, so like maybe an IT department's help desk, uh, but also serving the customers of the company. So we're going to have uh, some information here that's kind of helpful uh, if you're doing blended support like that, or uh, you know if you're doing straight customer service. So. It, it, some of the, the types of information that uh, organizations have for self-service, they'll, they'll have a, a, an order status, ticket tracking, history, customer history readily available. That's the most common thing that they'll have in their self-service. If there's a password reset tool, they'll have that readily available for self-service. Then they'll have a knowledge base um, with those FAQs in it. Um, and again, those should be real customer language and they should be, um, you know, the most frequently asked customer questions, and I'll talk more about that in a second. The software updates and patches, if, if that's what you offer, and collaboration with other users, and let me talk about that for a second. That usually comes in the form of forums, so about 15% of the organizations that we surveyed, and this is over uh, a, a few hundred organizations that we're talking about here, so this is not a small sample, um, have a forum uh, arrangements or you know, user collaboration, customer collaboration. And that's great, and some of the programs for that are extremely success successful as part of self-service. Um, customers assisting customers is a great way to go, but don't forget that there will be staff time involved in that because at some point somebody's going to have to review those answers and make sure that they are correct and complete. So uh, and I'll talk more about the staff involvement in some of this in a second. I'm just going to pull up a, a, a comment here that we got in this particular survey about self-service. So this is one way that this organization uh, publicized their self-service. A specific top ten list, they put some videos up and, and uh, made sure that people knew how to get into the self-service, that it was there, because a lot of times people don't know. So make sure that that's also apparent when somebody lands on your website that there is a self-service option, and make it easy for them to adopt the self-service posture for those things which they can solve for themselves. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the return on investment of self-service. One of the things that people cite or organizations cite when they go to do a self-service portal is that they can save some money because they won't have the contacts that they have now. And I mentioned on this slide that you need to be aware that if that's the only way that you're looking at it, by reducing live contacts and saving money, you might run into some issues <laughs> because that's not always the case. There are things you might not have thought about, uh, but that is one way in which self-service can save you money reduction in contacts if it costs $15 per phone call for your contact center and you can reduce that by a substantial number every month, you're going to be saving a good deal of money. The big bang for the buck comes from the extension of business hours. If you're not operating 24-7, let's say that you're a business that has assisted support available for 8 or 9 or 10 hours a day for 5 or 6 days a week, if you have a good self-service site, then those repetitive, frequently asked questions are going to be um, answered by your self-service site 24-7-365. So you can uh, you know, not have to hire additional staff, and you can make that information readily available. One of the things that you really need to do is to track customers on the site, and this is where your technology comes in handy see what their behavior is around the self-service portal that you have, see what they're doing, which articles are they accessing, which videos are they watching, how long do they spend, and what happens after they, they visit your site. If they look at three articles and then that same customer happens to call you, uh, then there's a pretty good bet that they didn't find what they were looking for. So be aware what they can't find. and that's one of the keys to tell you what you need to add to self-service. Look for patterns of behavior. Track the number of completed tasks, super important. 
How many times did they get to the self-service site, find what they were looking for, and done? They didn't have to call you. They didn't have to open a chat. They didn't have to email. They got their question answered. So taking an isolation, a reduction in the number of live contacts is not a huge thing. It's a good thing, but make sure that you're, you're tracking these other things as well. And I'm going to come back to one of those points in just a minute. So this is an, another uh, quote from one of the surveys that we did. So call deflection components have reduced costs of managing cases and improved the customer experience. So that is a, a plus for the business because you can save some money on reduced contacts, but it's also a plus for the customer because, remember, they want to solve their problem fast and they want to be able to do it themselves if they possibly can. I'm going to go back to this point that I mentioned a little bit earlier about saying things in the customer's language. It's really important, and uh, I'm going to give you an, an instance of how important it is and how much it can save you if you're careful about doing that, capturing the customer's language when they're talking to you. Um, have the, the representative or the agent do a search in your knowledge base in the exact customer's words. And uh, I'm going to talk about a met specific metric that measures your success in doing that. So any action suggestion should be as easy as possible. In other words, if you uh, ha want to have a customer click a button or do something, that should be easy, easy, easy. Allow for quick access to assisted service. As I mentioned before, put a button on your site to allow them to get to chat. And maybe what you want to do, if you have the technology, the capability to do it, is get those people who have already tried self-service to the head of your queue. Nobody likes, think about that, I'm going to say that again, nobody likes going to the website, searching for information, having to transfer to a phone call, getting into a phone queue where the first thing that the outgoing message says is go to our website at www. whatever because they've already been there, and especially if that message is repeated and repeated again. A lot of companies do that, and personally, I find it annoying, and a lot of customers do. So have you tried our website announcement? They have already done that. They've been there. If you can, get them to the head of the phone queue because they've already tried to help themselves. And the other thing is that once you have a self-service site, any information that you have there needs to be kept up to date. Somebody really needs to police that and make sure that the information that you have is correct, complete, and up to date. So, so important. The last thing anybody wants to get when they're having trouble or wants to get started using your product is incomplete or out-of-date information. Now, I'm going to go back again to that point, and I'm you know, I've made this repeatedly, and I'm going to continue to talk about it a little bit, and how important it is to have things in the customer's language. And what you see on this slide is a graph of a particular software release and the contacts to support after that release. And you can see, as you would expect, with a new product or service, you're going to get an, uh, an increased call volume, contact volume because people need to know how to use the new thing. The best way I've ever heard it expressed was by somebody I, I met at a meeting, and they said, yesterday the customer knew how to do their job, today they don't, because your product doesn't work the same way anymore. So the, the contacts continue to rise until the point at which the self-service is published, and then you can see there's a substantial drop-off. And this is an actual case and uh, this is uh, from an article called, What is LZS? And that's that metric I mentioned earlier, what is level zero solvable? And the way that you find out what is level zero solvable is to search the knowledge base in the words of the customer. And if you can't find it, you add those words as keywords in the article that you know is correct to give them the answer for that particular question. And the next time somebody searches in those customers' words, they will find them. So that extender hose that I mentioned before, for example, should also include the word vacuum hose because that's what the customer is going to be talking about. And you can uh, download this article. I think the URL is going to be available to you for download. It's a short article written by the Director of Training and Certification for both HDI and ICMI, Rick Joslin. It's excellent. Clearly explains the idea of LZS, and it's, it's extremely valuable information. And uh, there's been some research done on this, and I can tell you that not only 
uh, it makes your self-service metrics look better. It also increases other resolution metrics unexpectedly um, because it, it improves the search capabilities of your knowledge base for your interior facing knowledge as well. Uh, so make sure that you, you look into that. So the biggest pain points or hurdles for successful online forms, if, you, if you're having customers submit questions or submit for further information or submit to get something from you, uh, just make sure that uh, you get the end users to adopt it. And I mentioned some marketing techniques before, having a video, pointing them in the right direction, making sure that they're landing where you need them to land collecting the correct and needed information from users so that once you, that form is submitted, you don't have to go back and call them or contact them or email them again. You have to have corporate buy-in for this. Why? Because it's going to cost you money to set all this up, maybe to invest in some new technology. Uh, your cost savings will come later. Um, but remember that it is going to be important for people to back it and, and have the management and financial input that you need. Sometimes there's additional staff needed to support a self-service channel. Why? Because you've got to manage that knowledge. You've got to make those videos. You've got to do whatever it is you need to do to provide the customers the correct information. And sometimes it's decreased in efficiency for support. Even though it's supposed to make you more efficient, it might make you less efficient simply because if you don't have the proper staffing, people will be multitasking to try to up, keep up the self-service site at the same time they're doing the rest of their work, which is assisted service. So just be aware of those things. And that's some of the, some of the hurdles that we've discovered at HDI uh, with self-service adoption. So what goes into the business case for this? Well, first thing is that you're going to have to spend some money. As I mentioned, uh, there, there needs to be a good technological um, side to this. You may want to invest in some new tools. Uh, some of them may be talked about on this webinar today, so bear that in mind. Uh, generally, the simpler the user experience, the more expensive it is. Why is that? Because you have to really figure out, do some research, find out what the customers want, and make sure that the customer experience as they're trying to use this is as simple and easy as possible. So you have to focus your spending effectively. Once it is built and once it's, it's optimized, your self-service portal is inexpensive to operate. You don't have to feed it every day, um, except for the fact that you have to monitor it and keep it up to date. But you don't have to re-spend that technology money every day, whereas if you had people doing those repetitive answers and, and you know, the, the boring tasks of resetting passwords and all that kind of thing, you have to pay those people every couple of weeks. And then the variable costs uh, are far less than they would be doing live support. Simple enough, you don't have to provide for emergency staffing, you don't have to do all of those things. So your variable costs are going to go down. So just in, in summary, customers want self-service. We talked about that right at the top. It can be very cost effective, especially after setup. Think from the customer's point of view. Start with the customer, work back to the technology. Steve Jobs said it, a lot of other people have said it, and they're absolutely right. Think from the customer's point of view. And measure successful transactions. Remember earlier I measured complete, uh, said, suggested measuring completed tasks. So how often were they successful at finding what they needed or doing what they needed to do in order to provide service for themselves? And now to talk a little bit more about that and uh, the ways that some of this works is Susan Cohen. Take it away, Susan. Thank you, Roy. Good morning, afternoon to everybody on the phone. I'm Susan Cohen. I'm the head of Partnerships and Alliances at support.com, and I want to share some points of view on self-service and customer satisfaction. I'm going to start with two topics today self-service and changing customer behavior, and the secret sauce of customer satisfaction when looking at self-service. Customer preferences and behaviors are being measured almost daily. When you look out and do research on information, you're, you'll see that, that there are some really strong messages in the market today about the changing customer behavior. 
probably the most important thing is that customers are connected. In a recent survey from support.com, we found out that 89% of our respondents in the U.S. said that they're very connected or somewhat connected. And most people have more than one connection. They have a phone. They have some sort of device that they're connected to. There are unique characteristics about connected consumers. If you think about it, they have 24 by 7 access to information. And they've also changed the way that they learn. They're less interested in facilitated learning. They really don't look to manuals or tutorials. They have a tendency to turn to their trusted network, so social media, to understand how to use a product or to look into what they're about to buy. They have a, a very high expectation on product usability and have no patience for learning. A really important feature about these customers is they really care about staying in the frame of experience when they're looking for self-service. That means if they're on a mobile device in an app, they want to stay in that app and not have to leave and go to another search engine to find their answer. And they like to think of themselves as experts in using products. Customers have new preferences in learning about products and how to use them. They prefer self-service. This talks back to what Roy was saying earlier on. We found through Forrester Research that 76% of customers prefer self-service. They are apt to go to your website, to your FAQs is the first place they want to stop. It needs to be easily consumed for the customer to use it. Customers really like to find information and use it easily, like a warm chocolate chip cookie baking in the oven. You smell it, and you immediately want to eat it. Customers just want to consume when they have a product in hand or they're looking for something. Customers expect more. They really like to do things themselves. They want solutions in language that they understand. And they want it delivered in a fashion that's easy to follow, step by step, with bits of information presented to them at a time. In our survey of connected consumers, 50% of them indicated that they prefer to do it themselves when trying to deal with an issue. The danger is if they get in trouble, they'll probably go to a friend or turn to the web for a solution before reaching out to talk to your company for support. So it's very important that what you offer for self-service attracts them. This slide takes an interesting approach on how behavior of consumers is really changing. If you take a look, what is happening is that customer behavior is changed in the way they perform product research before making an acquisition. So if you look at this slide, it breaks the buying process into four stages. The first two stages, learning and defining needs, are stages where customers are in self-service research mode. They are navigating product sites and information on their own without asking for a vendor or salesperson's help to be involved. Your strategy for self-service really needs to take into consideration this customer behavior. The journey of the customer now begins in research mode, and there's an opportunity by delivering good self-service on your site to engage the customers early so you don't miss out and have them go somewhere else. In the connected world, customers go to the source with the best service. Support and service really needs to be considered an important part of your brand, and you need to be careful that your self-service voice 
isn't going to be stolen. In our survey of connected consumers, 79% responded that it's important to have a positive perception of a brand after making a purchase decision. Don't let your, your self-service voice be stolen. Customers want to solve the problem in a way that creates the least friction. So you need to satisfy their needs with information because you don't want them going to general blogs or competitors and have the experience hijacked, especially in the stage when they're evaluating new product options. As we've mentioned before, customers really do like self-service. In this information from Forrester Research, they've indicated that 75% of customers, 79% of customers prefer to use self-service and frequently ask questions when they go to a customer's website. Your FAQ page is really the first step in researching or solving a problem. You don't want your customers to go anywhere else. With that new behavior in mind of the customer, we need to look at what makes a satisfactory customer service interaction through self-service. Up in front of you is a typical customer journey. There, are, there may be two types of customers, customers that are using your product and immediately engage in a chat or send out an email or pick up the phone to be in touch with you. Some of them are going to choose to use self-service first, actually in growing numbers. When we, have a, we have a tendency to consider the point, which I have identified as collaboration here, where the customers need additional support after being in self-service as an escalation. I believe we need to change our language and treat this point of interaction as collaboration changing our perception as an organization of that interaction offers the opportunity for a positive experience that's better for both the customer and the agent. It's important that you arm your agents with the steps that the customer has taken in self-service. Our research has found that 24% of consumers expressed that they're having to repeat themselves was a point of frustration. In the contact center world, we've been providing agents with information on customer actions within an IVR for years. We need to provide agents the same level of information in digital self-service. I believe that customers set the rules for their own journey, especially when you're dealing with a demographic that includes the millennials. You need to guide them through learning, but in a way that they can make different stops based on who they are. 57% of customers think about a brand when considering a purchase, our research has discovered, and 48% think about the brand when looking to upgrade or replace an existing products. As customers begin pre-sales pre research on their own, your self-service needs to be focused on delivering them the information they want. Roy talked about using language that customers understand. We have a tendency to include acronyms or directions that mean different things to different people. We need to deliver directions in bite-sized chunks in simple language. Consider stepping customers through videos and images to help them as well. A really important point is that we are, your front-end customer-serving agents really have a lot of value to add to what should be part of your customer service. They can tell you where your customers customers stumble and the words they use to help the customers and make it understandable and help you gain insight. We, 
I recommend that you consider gaining those insights from your agents. They're a really important component. In our services business, we partner with our clients to ensure that the insights of our support team get back to them and we can share with them openly what their customer's journey is like. Recently, we had a client that introduced new technology for home automation. We started to receive a high volume of calls from the end customers experiencing issues with the initial install. Our agents quickly identified that the customers were missing a critical step in self-service. It was there, but they were missing it. We immediately told our client, who placed a new emphasis on the issue in their self-service, and the volume immediately dropped. As Roy mentioned, the way we look at self-service and measure success needs, needs to change. From a company perspective, it's really about customer success and looking at have you increased usage of your product, is there greater adoption, Are, is customer effort lower. From a company and business point of view, you still look at the, the reduced handle times and cost savings, but it's also very important to understand and gain product feedback from self-service as well as customers to understand why customers are coming to your site, what issues they're having with your product, what they're looking for, so that you can feed that information back to engineering and your product team so they can improve the product. Ultimately, you want your self-service to become important enough to your customers that they became raving fans of your product for your product. The secret ingredients in your secret sauce for successful self-service need to be about making information simple and putting it in a digestible format that delivers contextual guidance so that you're providing extra support to your customers. Make sure there's a seamless experience for customers to collaborate with your team if they can't solve the problem on their own. Customers are frustrated when they have to redo steps or retell what they've done. Provide your agents with the intelligence on where the customers have been and what they've done. It's really important to not let your self-service stagnate. Constantly talk to your front-end team about what's working what and what isn't. Look at your analytics. Explore where customers need collaboration and where they struggle. Self-service needs to empower your customers to succeed with your products. Support.com has been in the customer success business for a long time. Our software for self-service was designed to capitalize on the secret sauce of, successful, of a successful customer journey. It allows you to embed help in smart devices or provide self-service on the web so a customer can stay within a frame of reference. So if they're in a mobile device, we offer the support right in that mobile application. It provides contextual help in a step-by-step -step format that makes it easy to follow and allows you to seamlessly collaborate with your agents for live support. And it provides agents with a trail of information of what your customer has done. We hope this discussion, the secret sauce of self-service, has given you food for thought. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Susan, and, and thank you, Roy. Uh, certainly very timely presentation as many of us are beginning uh, the planning stages for 2016. So thank you both so much. Um, I did promise earlier that we would save a bit of time to take your audience questions. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, I just pushed out a link to you guys, uh, just a brief survey, about six or seven questions. 
um, we would be really appreciative if you just take a moment to complete that feedback form. Uh, just will help us to improve future presentations. Um, with that said, as promised, we will get into the audience Q&A, and I want to let you know that if for some reason we don't get the chance to answer your question here live, we'll definitely be sure to follow up offline and make sure that any questions left in the queue um, do get answered. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive right in. It looks like we've had some great questions coming in uh, so far. Um, a reminder, if you have any other questions you think of as we're going through the Q&A, you can type them in, um, into that question window and click Submit. So to kick things off, Susan, the first question is for you. Um, so Ed wants to know if you can comment a bit on what's the best way to capture the required information for problem management teams um, when customers are using self-service tools. Well, it's to look at the areas where customers are heavily using your self-service and are asking for collaboration and escalating and making sure that your agent team takes note of where customers are stumbling and participates in the process and helping you to refine the self-service. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Ed, for that question. Um, Roy, I want to toss this question over to you. It just came in from Katerina. And she is curious to know what your opinion is on self-service for an acute health service contact center, uh, of course, apart from emergency calls. Do you have any thoughts there? I think that um, knowing the healthcare uh, industry a little bit as we do at HDI, uh, first of all, time is of the essence. And if, it, if you can do self-service in such a way that the information is immediately accessible to the, the person that's looking for the information, apart from you know telephone call, great. Um, but what, here's what I suspect. Um, that person at the other end of the line is not going to want to look away from what they're doing because they're in the process of helping a patient or you know doing something for a doctor, whatever it happens to be. They're in that process. They're looking at a screen that's giving them information. They're not going to, wait to, to go away from that to do something else. So there might be some cases in which a self-service option is appropriate. I suspect that for most cases it is not. Okay. Thank you, Roy. And great question, Katarina. We hear that question a lot in our audience as well. Um, so, Roy, while I'm already chatting with you, um, I'll present this next question to you. Um, how can self-service information, um, how can self-service provide information that will drive improvement in the contact center? Sure. Susan actually addressed some of that. If, if you find, let's say, that an article regarding, let's go back to my silly example with the vacuum cleaner. If you find out that the most frequently accessed uh, knowledge article on your self-service site is about that extender hose, then you might want to consider redesigning that extender hose. So that's a case where just because the customers are asking questions repeatedly over time, that information can prove very valuable to your engineering and your product development teams, as Susan said. And Susan, you may want to comment on that as well. The information that you're gathering from where what customers are using and the path they took to get to an answer is very valuable information, especially in understanding where they needed to be escalated to collaboration. And by gathering the information in analytics and capturing it all, you can feed back to engineering and allow them to enhance product. Thank you both. So, so many good questions coming in. Uh, thank you guys and keep them coming. Um, just got one in from Alexander that I'm going to pose to you, Susan. And this is, again, a question that we hear all the time. Um, anytime you're implementing a new technology, it can seem very daunting. So, Susan, when starting or formalizing self-service tools, where do you think um, contact center leaders should start? You really should start by pulling a team together that includes your frontline agents and asking them the questions that they hear repeatedly and getting their input, as well as input from your product teams and a range of individuals with expertise across the organization. Start by looking at your most frequent calls and understanding 
the complexity of the steps that are needed to answer them and to start to lay them out and de deliver the information and test it with your agents is it always a really good way to start developing your self-service. Great. Um, let's see, we just had a question come in from Don, and he's looking for some insight around any rules of thumb to determine um, the required support self-service website metrics, um, you know, pulling metrics on uh, numbers of knowledge articles, those sort of things. So, Susan or Roy, do either of you have um, any insights on some of those metrics that are, are required for success? I'm going to jump in and say it's really hard to come up with a, a metric that works for everyone because it really depends on the complexity of your product and how much knowledge is needed to use it effectively. So to put a, a rule and thumb in place that works for every kind of product is difficult. It really is about that information that will be easy to digest and allow your customers to gain satisfaction. Uh, Roy, do you want to add to that? Sure. I, I think that a lot of organizations go at the knowledge question the wrong way. And one of the metrics that they measure is the number of articles created. Well, okay, that's fine, but what, what are the articles that are being used? And one of the key metrics is article reuse. How frequently is that article used? And um, that means that it's extremely valuable to the customers if they're using the same information over and over again. And again, you can take that information and feed it back into your product improvement or whatever, however you want to treat that. But it, article reuse is a really good metric to measure. Um, as far as, and I think you're asking about headcount here, uh, that really depends on how elaborate um, your site is. And again, it goes to complexity. Um, how complex is the information and how complex is the product. So it's, it's difficult to say. Awesome. Thank you again, Susan and Roy, and thank you, Don, for that question. Um, lots more coming in, so we'll keep pushing forward. Um, Susan, this question is for you. Uh, Laura asks, what tools can contact center agents use to effectively track feedback about self-service options? Well, support.com offers a product that has a, a capability built in that allows agents as they're servicing customers directly and they are dealing with collaboration customers who have been on self-service and end up connecting with them. We provide a mechanism that allows you to comment as an agent back on the questions that can be directed as self-service and allows an organization to understand the frequency of specific questions and the right steps that are take to solve that you need to take to solve a problem so that it becomes easy to determine which which areas should become self-service. Excellent. Thanks for that advice, Susan. Um, Roy, I have a question for you that just came in from Tommy. I think it will be a good one for you to tackle. Um, have you seen any research on the shelf life of a knowledge base? Um, you know, as new CMS platforms come online and become more popular, it might be enticing to migrate to a newer platform. Um, what are you seeing? So traditionally, what we've seen historically is that people will change a tool um, let's say a service management or a CRM tool every three to five years. However, that's beginning to change uh, primarily because of the introduction of uh, software as a service, you know, SaaS platforms. It's becoming more frequent because it's so much easier to do. You don't have to rip everything out of your servers and figure out who's going to staff it and all that kind of thing. Now you can switch from one provider to another fairly easily. So the cycle is becoming shorter, and now it's about two years on average that people will change the tool. So your question about the knowledge base depends a lot on whether that tool is built into that system. Is it in your CRM, or is it part of your CRM or your service management tool, or is it a separate standalone knowledge base that you use separately? In that case, you can run that until it's obsolete or you know no longer supported, whatever you want to do. But in general, 
um, about every two years uh, now, two, two to three years, let's say, for the replacement of your service management tool. And in that case, your uh, knowledge base would be part of that. Awesome. All right. I think we have time to tackle a couple more questions here. So we'd love to know, uh, this is a question from Rebecca. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on articles reused as a metric and specifically how you can tell if that means the article is helpful or it means it may have been poorly written or confusing? Do you guys have any insight to share there? Well, it's always helpful to ask customers on that are using self-service on your website whether an article was helpful or not. And it's also easy to tell if they didn't, asking the customer if it solved the problem, and if it didn't, if they escalated to live support, you'll know that the, the particular article wasn't helpful and they needed to go somewhere else. So begin to measure. Start to look at how your articles are being used and how the guidance that you're providing to your consumers is solving their problem. And you can gain insight and make improvements based on usage and let, let knowledge articles that aren't being used drop off and replace them. And those that are creating the need for collaboration take the feedback from your front line and change the article and adapt it. Okay. Awesome. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one comes from Jennifer, and I'd love to hear from both of you on this one. Um, she would love to know if you can uh, kind of wrap it up with by sharing three or four actionable practical um, items that you would suggest uh, that teams start practicing immediately when it comes to improving their self-service. So um, for you guys, what would you like to leave our audience with today? Neither one of us wants to go first. <laughs> Corey, you can go first. Okay, great. We'll do it in alphabetical order by last name. Okay, that's fine. Um, so here, here are a couple. The first thing is maintain conversations with your customers as much as possible. Gather information from them. That's number one. And, and, and the way that you can do that is ask them, especially if they're on assisted service and, and you know that they've come from your, your self-service as it is now, ask them what, what, what you could have done to make it better for them. So that's, that's number one. Have the conversations with your customers. Second thing is look at that article that I um, talked about earlier. Uh, it gives you several easy steps that you can start doing right off the bat to improve the quality of the information that you're showing to customers uh, and, and in, increase the, the searchability. Well, the searchability isn't that important. The findability is what's really important in your knowledge base, right? If you can, you can search all you want, but if you can't find what you're looking for, it's no good. So it will improve the findability of the information in, in your knowledge base check out that level zero solvable, and that is a measurable metric as well. So talk to your customers, improve the quality of the information that you have available to them, and then measure how you're doing. And I'm going to add, look for a tool that helps you. So understand the key criteria for your customers and find a tool that can help you by providing your customers with context for support, can help you design your self-service so it delivers step-by-step -step instruction, and also provides your agents with information upon collaboration of what your, your customers have already done so they don't have to repeat themselves. Well, I think that's a, a great way to end our presentation today. And right now I'm actually going to push out a link for you guys, uh, just a little extra reading material. Um, this will actually take you right to the article about LZS that Roy has mentioned a couple of times now. Uh, so, again, highly encourage you to check that out. Um, but just a couple more announcements before we go. I just want to remind you, again, that we will be making this presentation available for on-demand viewing. Um, so you'll get an email in the next couple of days that gives you instructions to view the on-demand presentation. And you can also download a PDF version of the slides directly through this console um, after we end the presentation. I um, want to thank you all for your participation today. I want to thank both Roy and Susan for their insight. 
Uh, and before we go, I do need to mention that this presentation is copyright 2015 by ICMI. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by ICMI, which is solely responsible for its content, and support.com is responsible for their content and opinions. Uh, so on behalf of ICMI and our speakers, as well as our sponsor, support.com, we thank you for attending today. Have a great afternoon.